Everybody, welcome back to Endure the Athlete Story. Today's guest, we have Steve True. Steve's a legend in the sport of triathlon. He's been in the sport for almost 40 years and has competed in triathlon. He's coached at the highest level, coaching Olympians and world champions. And in this episode, Steve tells us about his coaching, about his career, and we learned so much. He gives us so much tips and there's a lot of value in there for anyone that's competing at the moment and uh you just get a lot of solid solid advice from steve i first met steve in 2013 when he came to Derry to for the city of culture triathlon and he coached a session with the northwest triathlon club uh in the pool and it was a brilliant session there were so many new techniques that he taught and new sessions and you hear this kind of stuff in the interview of um just his, his style of coaching and it's it's fun, it's engaging and I think you'll get a lot from it. Steve's also commentates in triathlon. He's been the voice in Olympic triathlon and open water swimming and WTS racing over the last few years. And it's just it was just great to get a chat. Uh really nice guy and really down to earth and he tells us about the the history of the sport and uh, where it came from and where it's gotten day to day so i think you'll enjoy this one and as usual this show was brought to you by egx2 coaching i'm a triathlon coach with a background in sports science i provide lactate testing for anyone based in the northwest of ireland and if you are interested in getting a chat about your coaching about your training plan um, feel free to get in touch you can email me at ejx 2 coaching at hotmail.com or drop us a message on facebook and instagram or at ejx2 coaching um as i say i'd be more than happy to get a chat to you and help you out um for any upcoming events or if you're looking for some coaching please feel free to get in touch so without further ado let's get into it steve true Steve True, welcome to Endure, the athlete story. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It's a pleasure to have you here. How's things? Things are good. Things are good. We, um, Veronica and I moved out of London 18 months ago. We're down on the south coast, uh, literally three minutes walk from the sea. Beautiful. And to my shame, I have not yet been open water swimming. But <laughs> we're, we're working on that. And I did get back, I got back in the pool and then, of course, lockdown started, so it's been a it's been a real no no. But yeah. Uh, yeah, life is good, Emmett. Life is good. Good stuff. Whereabouts on the south coast are you, Steve? Some of the south coast. Where am I? Yeah, um, in Paul. Paul, it's about um, it's about ten minutes away from Bournemouth. Um, okay. But there's a, a few of my friends already were living down here. Some moved out of London. Some were based here. So that was some of the attraction. Yeah. Uh, a couple of girls I used to swim with and do triathlon with who are already here. So so it was nice. And kids growing up, my, my kids now are both mid-20s. Um, they'd moved out and it was, it just made sense. You know, mm -hmm. we were in a, a, yeah, a nice house in London, but compared to, uh, you, you know, Emmett, you know what it's like, compared to what you can buy outside London to what you're in with London. Yeah. And we just... Well, it's about time a little bit of a change of lifestyle um still still want to be very very much involved in triathlon mm -hmm. um so going up to london with some of the races some of the commentaries it's a little bit more but it's so well worth it yeah. so well worth it yeah. it's a beautiful part of the world um i, I spent a year in cornwall so some okay. not too far from where you are and beautiful part of the world great for training open water swimming surfing so it's definitely a lovely place I had a bit of um a bit of a misspent youth in, in Cornwall. I used to <laughs> surf and do that stuff when I was 18, 19, 20, 21. Um, in and around Newquay, Crantor, Parampolf, yeah, all up yeah. on the north coast. I loved in and, uh Porth Town. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know that. That's a it's a cool spot. Oh uh, lovely. So that's still, good. we try and go down a couple of times a year, stay um little hotel just on Fistral Beach. 
Mm-hmm. Walk on the beach, tell everybody how good I used to be, and everyone knows <laughs> walk away back. Yeah, it's just good. <laughs> well, Steve, tell us about then if you're going back, tell us about 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 yourself, how you get on the sport, or what was it? What sport was it first that you first got on the and started your okay. passion? I was um, I, I swam as a kid, and um, I. I yeah, the usual thing, I swam as a sort of primary school. And then I went to secondary school, so 11 or 12, pretty much packed it up. Mm-hmm. It was, um, I, I think a lot of the thing was, oh, you know, you're going to grammar school now, you've got to work hard, you've got to work hard. And then I, I got back into swimming probably when I was 16. Uh, and that, that was quite a tough thing to, mm-hmm. to going in when you were relatively old. But I think because I had swum you know, at a junior school, I got back into it, um, went to nationals a couple of times, national swimming um, on 100 butterfly, 200 butterfly, which was then 110 yards and 220 yards. That's how long ago it was in the 60s. Uh, and I was running at school, um, but I was pretty much running on just on swim fitness, just on, on basic aerobic endurance fitness. Mm. Um, carried on swimming through college, um, that, that's sort of when I went to nationals and ran a little bit for college again on pure fitness. And I started teaching in 1969. And there was another guy teaching in the borough, a little bit older than me, who was a very, very charismatic running coach. And he said, oh, you need to come down. You need to come down. Well, you know, we can do some stuff, which really appealed to me. Because, again, at that time, if you're still swimming at the age of 22, well, you know, you're really old. Like the kids go, what? Um, so I got into running and um, I, I went to the three A's, went to national championships uh, and, and came away with um, a couple of silvers, a bronze and, and some final positions over the years. And that was over middle distance, so 800 metre, 1500 metre running. Mm-hmm. And then just going through and I think the, uh, the whole thing with running and, and again sort of mid 70s, it was the marathon boom. Mm-hmm. And you say, so, okay, so hang on, I'm, I'm an 800 meter runner and I want to do a marathon, but that's what you did. Yeah. And it, it moving up to that. And I ran the, I ran the Wolverhampton Marathon in 1983. This is how boring I am, Emmett. Right? I, re- <laughs> I remember I can give you days. I can tell you what the weather was like. Um, and I ran the, ran the Wolverhampton Marathon. And, um, I, I, I just I wanted to do a decent time. I'd run London a couple of times and blown up badly in one of them. Mm-hmm. And I was on the start line for Wolverhampton. Uh, and I said, right, look, I want to go whatever it was. I think I said, I want to go around 245, something like that. Um, um, and I'm, I'm crazy at pacing. Any, anyone going around at that time? And this guy said, oh, yeah, that's what I'm doing. So this guy, um, it was it was fabulous. And we went through 20 miles in two hours, six minutes, which, again, I'm a real, you know, you don't want to know. Two hours, six minutes and 10 seconds. Um, and we we got we were going around. And I said, oh, so, you know, what you did? He said, hey, so I'm, I'm doing this. I'm, I'm getting ready for something called a triathlon. And I went, oh, yeah, what's that then? So, and, and that really was my introduction to it. And he was doing... It was, it was an Ironman distance, although I don't think you were allowed to call it Ironman in those days. Mm-hmm. Um, so we do this swim in a swimming pool in Northampton, and then um, we get on the bike, but you've got to be back at 3 o'clock in the afternoon because that's when the Northampton Marathon starts, boom, boom, boom. And that was it, and I just thought, wow, that, that was really great. So I, I, had a, I did have a very good run. Uh, for me, I ran a 240 marathon, which was by far my best at that time. And um, after that, I got injured. And that was sort of the impetus. to. I kept thinking about triathlon. I thought, I need to do something. I need an aim to get my fitness back. Mm-hmm. So I thought, okay, we can do this. And I, I started going swimming by myself, um, which took a little time to get back into. And then I did in September the 18th, 1983, I did the Big K triathlon in Liverpool, which, which was great. And I mean, it changed my life. It changed mm. my life, really so, did. So that was your first proper race then. At what age, what age were you then in 1983? I was, crikey, I was 36 then when okay. I started. 
So, so I think it was a, really a continuation of keeping going. Yeah. And I, I honestly believe if I hadn't found triathlon, I probably would be sitting here in my slippers and with a big pipe on and be cardigan and, you know, all that stuff. But you, I, I think for all of us, uh, and when I was in Derry, I, and I think every time I've been in Derry, it doesn't matter where you're from in the world. If you do triathlon, you we all know we're a little bit crazy. Yeah. But we're all kind of proud of it as well. Yeah. And I, and I still get a great buzz of getting on my bike. And when when I do get back to swimming, getting in the water and, you know, okay, I, there's no there's no way I can swim the speed I used to or ride or whatever. But it's still so lovely to be able to do it. Mm-hmm. And I think, and I'm sure some of the guys that I've met in Derry over the year, and particularly the last time I was over, those of us of a certain age, and I, I see some of my cousins and my family and my friends from when we were kids, um, and I don't mean to be rude and disrespectful, but they've got old mm-hmm. because they don't do anything. They're retired. They maybe don't get up in the morning till 10 o'clock and read the papers and that's the day gone yeah and i still i still get a huge buzz of getting up in the morning and i'll um get on the turbo or if the weather's really great get out on the bike um and when i was swimming getting down in the pool early morning session you sort of i think you've beaten the day yeah you've beaten the day. Yeah. When I was um, based in London, it would be very much um you know I'd go swimming get on the tube going to central london to be working and i'm thinking but I've done a little bit more than you guys already. Yeah. You know, we've started. And I think that, I know that sounds very flash and posy and whatever, but it, I believe it. I believe yeah. it. Um, I have this thing on Facebook at the moment because I've got far too much time when I'm not doing anything. And this whole thing about Carpe DM sees the day. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's true, isn't it? You, you've got to have a name to be doing stuff like that. And it's... um. To me, it's the whole outlook on life. You know, don't don't throw it away. Don't waste it. Mm-hmm. Just just because the years to tell you you're in your seventies or whatever doesn't mean a stuff. Mm-hmm. I still do. Um, we do a training camp in Italy, May every year, and we've now missed two years because yeah. of you. Know, um, but last uh, year before last, there were seven of us in our seventies on training camp. Really? Um, and that was that was with Desi and yeah. me. And, Chris and we had a lovely, lovely lady, Eddie Brocklesby, who's still racing Ironman. And Eddie is 78 this year. Mm. And she would come out and she'll put the guys to shame on the bike. <laughs> you know, and I think it is the way that you choose to live your life. You know, yeah. we, we can do this stuff. We it's really def- can. It's definitely a sport for for life, maybe not racing at a, a high level or anything, but just the community, the social aspect of it, the variety yeah. of swimming and biking and running and even within uh, my own wee training group like it's like there's a variety there's a young guy a teenager and there's a few guys in their 30s 40s and then my father-in-law he's he says a secret is to train with us younger guys he's in his 50s and it keeps him keeps him sharp so it's definitely it's a great sport for community and we had um I had greg bennett on the show last week oh, and greg uh is- like that's he's what he's nice he said no yeah he's he's a great guy like he said is he just loves the community even though yeah. like his days of racing and winning championships are over he just loves the community and being involved in triathlon and meeting the people at races and stuff so it's definitely i think a big part of it for for everyone yeah i keep in touch with greg um probably more than any of the other aussie friends of mine um just on facebook and the old yeah. email um, and I remember interviewing Greg and Laura at the London Triathlon, and it was either just before or just after Athens when Greg had that fabulous fourth place. And mm-hmm. I used to love watching Laura, especially on the bike. I just thought she was tactically so good. Um, and with what Greg is doing now, you know, he's just, wow, he's, he's just the best man to be doing that stuff. He's yeah, absolutely yeah. definitely another, another guy that just was so helpful and agreed to come on the show and, uh, I can't thank him enough for, it. um, same as yourself, but Steve, tell us then about how, when you got hooked on triathlon, where did that lead you next? 
Okay, um, I think I think if I'm honest, Emma, I was very, very lucky because uh, you know back in the day, sort of early '80s, whatever, um, it was very new, and so probably there are only maybe about 200, 300 triathletes in the in the whole of UK. Uh, and so I did one race in 1983, then uh, 1984, I think I did, I, I know, six or eight races. But every race that you went to, it was the same people. Mm-hmm. You know, you'd be either in London, first ever London triathlon was 1984. Um, I was racing up in Sunderland, in where, bomb, bomb, just wherever it was, wherever there was a race. And you're seeing the same guys. Uh, and that year as well, it was probably when the, the British squads got together um, and we did the, the London to Paris team triathlon, which was, that was pretty amazing. Uh, and it was a, a three-day event. So day one, we ran from Marble Arch down to Dover and it was about 100 miles. So you've got four guys in the team mm-hmm. and everyone's got to do, a I know, a minimum of 20 miles or something. So you know, um, number one runners doing 15 miles, number two runners doing eight, number three. So I remember mm-hmm. running three times on that. And then the last, it was the last three or four miles into Dover, you had to have three members of the team going in together. And then the next day was swim the channel. You've got to do a, a mile at least each time, boom, boom, boom. And then day three was riding from Calais down into Paris, which was... You know, you, you do your one one run, one one rides, one rides, and I think the last 30 miles or whatever, we had the, the team of four of us going into Paris. And being honest and realistic, we were pretty appalling, the Brits. We were pretty appalling. <laughs> they, they, the British girls were fabulous. Sarah Springman was racing. Um, and, yeah, they, they were miles better than we were. But it was a huge learning curve uh, and, and a huge opportunity. Um it, it, it was just you went and you learned all the time all the time then you, you're starting you know discussing talking about training and how you get about with it and you know what's the best swimming or you know the same stuff we still talk about now yeah and i think we you know, start reinventing it and it was like well no cycling's got to be the most important because it's the longest one but then really well if you've dropped three minutes on the bike then you know you're going to be very lucky and of course those days there was no drafting mm-hmm. so it was so you could be i was very very average on the bike you know my swimming was reasonable uh and my running was quite good at that time but i'd lose everything on the bike and then be trying to make up mm-hmm. whereas you you look at the guys now i mean where where's the weakness with fredino or brownlee or oh, mm-hmm. spirit danny reef you know there there is no weakness whatsoever you know, and it's just mm-hmm. overcoming that. And that's that's the huge learning thing. And I think we've also, I think also all of us have learned uh, an amazing amount in in training. And um, from my point of view for coaching, because my 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 background in coaching was um, we, with some of the teaching I was doing early on, I was coaching running and coaching swimming mm-hmm. and everything based on on interval training. So, you know, you want to be a good 1500 meter runner. Well, then you're doing maybe 12 lots of 400 with a 200 meter run recovery. If you want to be a good swimmer, whatever, you're doing 20 by 100 with 15 seconds, whatever. And, and at that time, biking seemed to be, well, we'll go out and we'll do the long rides. And then the winter, we don't do anything. Mm-hmm. And then come February, maybe, or March, you do the 10 mile time trials. And then the next month, it's the 25 mile time trials. And so when I started coaching, I was doing a lot of stuff on the bike, just on, on intervals. Mm-hmm. And then you've got people like uh, Chris Baldwin and Peter, his coach, who were very much using that five-level system on the bike, mm-hmm. which, you know, people like Frank Horwell in running, um, George Gandy at Loughborough, Peter Coe, Sebstad, have been using all the time. And that sort of five-level of... of effort and work where you've got to do some work at race pace Mm -hmm. and some work that little bit faster and some work much faster and you've got to do the endurance and I think that's what's become much much more balanced now with um with the guys at whatever level not just the top level but even for 
you know, old fogies like me, if I want to, if I want to get back racing, then I've got to be a lot more positive with what I do intervals on the bike. And rather than getting in the water and going, oh, well, I'm going to do a 2000 meter swim or I'm going to do 40 lots of 50, mm-hmm. um, I need to be pushing it a lot more. So I, th- I think that's where we've learned that we've started getting the, the sort of background knowledge from the three sports and trying to adapt them and move them over. Having said that, you know, you can't, you couldn't put the workload that you would on a young swimmer onto that same age doing a runner because yeah. it would break she or him down. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we swim when I was coaching to just coaching to a decent level just a couple of years ago and, you know, working with pretty young kids, 12, 13 year olds, we would have no problem doing 20 by 100 in the swimming pool with very limited recovery. If you adapt that to swimming, uh, to running, from swimming to running, that'd be like doing 2400s on the track for a 12 year old little girl runner. Ooh, yeah. I don't think so. You know, you yeah. do that once, you can come back. So that that's the whole thing as well, you know. And um, so going along with that, what sort of recovery, what sort of, what does it take out of you or on your body? So yeah. we, we start, you know, the classic stuff, find out what you're good at, what you're not so good at. And in training, you work at what you're not so good at to, to really make yourself better. Yeah. It must have been a, I suppose it could have been frustrating, but a fun process to figure all that out kind of for yourselves because nowadays you've got unlimited resources and articles and videos and training tips, whereas then you were trial and error, was it, to get get it right? I, I think so, but I, I, I was very <clears throat> I was very privileged with my 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 my, my, my one swimming coach, particularly one running coach particularly. Um, and I idolized both of them. And I learned so much from them of what I was doing and, and tried to adapt that. So I think that probably that having a background in this sounds so posy, I'm sorry, but having a bit of a background in coaching two sports, mm-hmm. it sort of makes me maybe just think about it a little bit more. Um, and and with, with swimming, so much of it is on your technique. And your your ability in the water to use that technique, whereas maybe less so in cycling and running. And I, I think when I've sort of maybe been coaching some older triathletes who don't have a background in swimming, some of the sort of philosophy and the effort that goes in is right, bang, we're gonna really bang this out. And I think what we need to be doing as coaches is saying, okay, well, let's slow down a little bit and let's find out, you know, what, what do you need in swimming? Well, you need to have a flat body. Oh, yeah? Be well, well because of the resistance. Because if you're swimming like that, you've got all the water hitting you. So let's get like that. Mm. And really, the legs are the balance. Oh, so you don't have to quit too hard. No, because, you know, the amount of propulsion, the amount of speed you're going to get is probably 5%, maybe 10% if you're going mad. So let's use those for balance and think about the upper body. And what's the length of the stroke? You know, do we really try and turn over fast or do we, you know, just really think about it? I'm going to have a glass of wine. Uh, so I think all, all that sort of thing, and I, I get a real buzz from coaching and with, with my, um, my master's swimming group, it was fabulous because you know, some of the older guys may be coming into swimming from a different sport. You can see that really, really big improvement early on. Now, that does not make me a great coach by any means, but it's maybe getting the information through. Mm -hmm. Uh, And one of the guys I worked with a lot, Dan Bullock, who was a real top international swimmer for a number of years, um, missed out on the Olympic Games twice by one position in the trials. Dan's 50. He can still go under a minute for a 100 long call freestyle. Uh, And because his technique is absolutely superb. Yeah. And when I'm... I can't say I'm coaching with Dan, but if I've we, we do quite a lot of work together, he will lead the, the swim sessions and, and I'm there with my notepad and writing it down and writing it down, writing it down again. And then the next session that I take, my swimmers will go, Steve, that was brilliant. Wow, that was so good. I'm thinking, thank you, Dan. You know, it's like, <laughs> that and it, there, there is that, there is that thing. I mean, I think to, to be a reasonable coach, you've got to be so open and yeah. be prepared to hear from other coaches. Um, 
and you know if, as soon as you think you know it all you, you go and yeah. you've forgotten yeah you know? Well, I think even even uh, the time you came to Derry and coached a session that I was in in the Northwest Triathlon Club, you told us about a drill, the head led yeah, drill. Great evening. The head led drill. I think that was you, you taught us that, and uh, I'd still use that and uh, uh-huh. with some with some people I coach like. So it's a good drill, as you say, for that body position, just working out where they need the where they need to straighten up. So. I think you have to be humble, obviously, as a coach, and always learn. And you, you can tick and tick and steal from other coaches as well if you think it's going to work for your own athletes. That, that was lovely. I remember saying, "Right, we're going to try and swim with cross the ankles over." And you get we got halfway down the pool, and you could see some of the guys with their toes actually sitting on the bottom, and it yeah. was like, <laughs> now I'm going to use your legs for that. Oh wow, great! That's brilliant. Love it. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And and then. Steve, did the coaching take over from your own career as an athlete? Then did you did you enjoy the coaching more? Or how did that work out? Yeah, I did, and um, um, I'd, I'd I'd raced properly for about ten years, mm-hmm. um, but I was getting more and more injured, and I, I think a lot of that was sort of my running background and trying to move up a distance when I didn't need to. And you, you get more injuries and recovery takes longer. Uh, and back in the day, I didn't do any real stretching. Mm-hmm. Um, didn't do any sort of real good gym work, strength work that everybody does now. Yeah. So it, I had, if I had my time again, which I probably wouldn't wish to because it's never better the second time round. Mm-hmm. If I had my time again, I probably would have done a lot more extra background work and try and maintain sort of general body fitness mm-hmm. and and coaching just became a natural thing to me I loved I, I taught for 19 years um and I enjoyed 15 years of it um and then it's just stopped being enjoyable but mm-hmm. so much of what you're doing when especially when I was a PE teacher you're you're teaching the skills and, and you know you you've got doesn't matter what the kids are like if they're if they're tough if they're easy where where they come from backgrounds doesn't matter a stuff you know if you can get through to kids then you can get through to anybody so mm-hmm. I, i've just felt privileged again to come in uh, at that particular time and i it i still get the absolute biggest buzz you know i really really get a buzz on the coaching thing mm-hmm. and again it's sort of um with my background on on swimming and running, it, it it was lovely. And again, with triathlon, I think the early days was very much the more mileage you can do, the better it is. Um, and I think there's still an element of that, particularly when you go to the longer distances, seventy point three and uh, full Ironman. But I think with you know with sprint and Olympic distance, so much is important on on interval training. And, and again, focusing on those, those five speeds. There's one one particular athlete I was talking to today, um, and and she's had a really quite nasty injury, and, and she's been good. You know, she's won she's won seventy point three in the pro ranks, and oh, so that you you know you don't get that on good looks and weak germ, do you? You really got mm-hmm. to work your butt. But she stepped up her training maybe too much, and is now getting the injuries. Mm-hmm. So it's a little bit of a reflective time. I have no doubt that she'll come back. But I think when, when stuff goes wrong, you, you've got to look at why it went wrong. What do I do to get it back? So I, some of the stuff that I see in coaching, and again, I mean, don't, no disrespect. When you see some of the programs that are written out and they'll go in the, the books or the, the magazines and, you know, how to do an Ironman in six weeks. Well, <laughs> you know, well, yeah, you might get through it, but you're not going to do another one for a couple yeah. of years. Yeah. So I, I think that's the, the thing to know yourself really well. And, and sure, yes, you should look at all the suggested programs and then say, but does this work for me? And if I'm already running 35 minutes for a 10K, maybe I'd be a little bit better on concentrating on the swimming because I'm only doing 1,500 metres in an hour or something. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's a no-brainer. And that's an over-exaggeration. But I think that's what we need to look at, you know, and not not one of the guys at top level now 
has a weak discipline. Mm. And, and if they do, and I think even over the last couple of years, we've seen some of the boys and some of the girls who've been dominating, but they've maybe, I wouldn't say they're weak in one discipline, but maybe just being not quite top world level, that's now being found out. Mm -hmm. And that's how quickly our sport is changing. And yeah. I've got no doubt there will be many, many more changes coming up. You know, somebody will have the next best thing. You know, this is what we've got to do. If we don't do bump, write it down. Everyone go, oh, wow, that's great. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a bit like getting getting the kit, Emmett, isn't it? You know, well, if I don't have the new super best goggles, which have got the shiny bits and whatever, get out of here. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't matter. You know, yeah. and when, one of the things I had a... a a bit of a row with my swim group is um, they're all swimming with watches on because they're all triathletes, most yeah. of them triathletes. And it's like coming in at the end of the 100, boom, and you pray, why are you doing that? It's a the bloody clock on the wall. Look at it. Yeah, but I want to get the exact time to it. I said, does it really matter if you're swimming 85 or 85.7? You know, we, we almost like take, you, you've got to have it. It's, um, what's, what's the quote? All the gear and no idea. Yeah. You know, oh, <laughs> shiny castle, all this sort of thing. Come on. Uh, and, and everything is just downloaded and Garmin and all that thing. No, let, let's maybe sometimes just get away from it. Yeah, yeah. sure. Wear it and just have a look at it. But, you know, um, but for, for me, I met the, the how hard you're working is RPE, rate of perceived effort. You know, how does this feel to me on a 1 to 10 or a 1 to 20? Yeah. Well, if it's like three, maybe you ain't working hard enough. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's a lot of almost going back to the basics where, where you look at that sort of stuff. Yeah. And and in your coaching, Steve, what would your like overall, it's probably a very broad question, but your overall philosophy on you've touched on about there of your coaching philosophy for for let's say like an Olympic distance, like and if you could to take us through some of the athletes you, you might have coached around that distance or at elite level? Um, <clears throat> I've been, well, forgive me for showing off, but I, I've, I've coached six world champions mm -hmm. uh, group level um, and junior level. Um, I've coached three Olympic athletes and I probably think every single one of them would have succeeded whether I've been coaching them or not. Mm -hmm. But you, you establish a rapport with the athletes and it, it doesn't matter how much they know, how little they know, but it's almost that trust element. Uh, and I, I'm thinking of two, two particular athletes now. Um, one, one of whom went to the Olympics and one of whom won a world age group title in a very, very competitive age group. And with, um, well, with, with the Olympic athlete, with Sean Bryce, went to the Sydney Games. Well, mm -hmm. So we would we try to work out Sean's program. And I say, okay, so this week, this is what we're doing. And Sean would have a look at it and go through and go, okay, why, why are we doing six by one mile in that? And I'd have to, well, I've got to be absolutely on the ball mm -hmm. because this is what we need. Uh, and Sean, Sean was coming from an international track background, great 800, 1500 meter runner. Um, so we've got to take her up to 10K. Yeah. And it worked. It worked. And um, Joanna, Joanna Hind, who won the world championship with Joe, tell me what to do, Steve, and I will do it exactly. So you, you established that rapport to be going through. Um, and I've never coached a male world champion. So I'm not sure what that says about me or the people who choose to work with me. But um, isn't that weird? Uh, and, and from ages from 17 to mid 60s. So may, maybe I'm just a hidden ladies man or something, or I, <laughs> maybe a charm. I don't know. <laughs> you get the, <laughs> the world champion woman anyway. But um, and so do you feel you just have to? adapt as a coach on a personal level with each different athlete and find out what works for them. And I think also it's, um, I think as a young coach, you're starting out, um, 
they, 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 they become, your, your athletes become very, very close to you, very important, quite rightly too. Um, and then when, if a coach-athlete relationship breaks down, which probably more than 50% do, you know, athletes change coaches, coach change athletes. Mm-hmm. I mean, for the first couple of times it happened to me, it was like my girlfriend was packing me up. I'm, what if I go, you can't, you can't do this, do you not understand? And of course you get a little bit older and it's part of the process. And the important thing is to maintain a really good relationship with everybody you've ever worked with. Mm-hmm. And, and whether they're being coached by somebody else or whether they're coaching a different athlete or the relationship changes, of course it does. And you, you've got in, in so many sports, you know, you, you could look at guys like Carl Lewis in track and field who had the same coach right the way through his career from, from junior right to multi-Olympic champion. Mm-hmm. You can look at Michael Phelps, exactly the same, you know, from a 13-year-old kid, five Olympics, same coach right the way through. Mm-hmm. Um, if you read some of Michael's stuff, amazing rows and amazing walks off, walk off the side of the pool, and, but it, it worked. But mm-hmm. for other athletes who've been equally as, no, not equally successful, they're, they're different, but who've been very, very successful at world level, who've maybe had three, four, five different coaches mm-hmm. just over the years. And just um, just recently, um, I know that uh, Daniela Reef and Brett Sutton, who's been coaching her amazingly, and, and that relationship has stopped. Now, Dan is not saying, oh, no, that's it's all gone. It's just I'm really, really grateful, but I maybe need to look at something else. Yeah. So, I, I, again, Emily, it's almost that absolute openness. Um, and I've worked alongside some absolutely brilliant coaches Dan, Dan Bullock who I mentioned earlier the swim coach um, worked with Bill Black from Great Britain Chris Jones from Great Britain on, on the you know the coaching side with British teams and, and other athletes mm-hmm. and, and I think we've all had where we've interchanged athletes uh, and relationships and and when you're on camp you know with when uh, with the British team we maybe have a nine-week training camp abroad I, I couldn't give up that amount of time, uh, and nor could Bill. So we would like to maybe do a, a three week stint each. Yeah. So I've got the athletes that I'm working with, um, some of the athletes that Bill or Chris are working with, and some of the athletes that are coming from another coach. So the whole time you, you've got to you've got to be totally open and say, look, this is what I, I suggest. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think? So we we maybe have a thing um, with. I'd have uh, Sean Bryce and Annie Anderson down on the same camp. And I'd say, look, I, I think we're doing uh, six by a mile today, use that example again. And Annie would say, well, Bill, Bill says I should be doing four by 2,000 metres or five by 2,000 metres. Now, that's pretty close. Mm-hmm. So you, you can accommodate that, you can adapt that. And then may, you know, maybe some of the other guys um, with Simon Lesson on camp, hang on. I've got, I've got a guy here who's won however many world championships and I'm telling him what to do and I'm not his coach. So you've got to create that relationship where, where things will go through. So again, it's being uh, being adaptive and being adaptable. So, so you can play around with the sessions, juggle the sessions. I don't know, if, if you're working with uh, an athlete, you're, you're coaching specifically, and you're always having rows, then something's maybe going wrong. And that's some, you know, some you, you start thinking, well, look, Maybe this just isn't working. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, it happens. It's like really, you know, you, you've got to work with guys sometimes, but you you choose who you want to work with. Ath- uh, coaches never choose athletes. Athletes choose coaches. Yeah. You know, people say um, some coaches. I've known. Oh, why? Oh, I, I could tell her this. I could tell them that. And well, you've you've got to get that working relationship. You don't have to be best friends and go out for a glass of wine or dinner every night. But there's got to be that working relationship with respect. So this this is what she's doing for me, and this is what he's doing for me, and and all mm-hmm. that sort of thing. And that mm-hmm. that's really really important. Um, I, I mentioned Desi McHenry earlier on. Yeah. Now I've never coached Desi, and I wouldn't have been to. But we're great friends, and yeah. we've raced each other a number of times over the years. And I've had some lovely lovely arguments with Desi, and that's really healthy you know, about this is what we should be doing. And we have a great respect for each other. But you've still got to be able to say, look, this is what I think. And someone says, well, I'm not so sure about that. And they go, 
okay, that's fine. We just disagree. You know, there, there's different ways of doing things. We know mm-hmm. that always has been. Mm. And, and and your coaching. So which one? Steve, <laughs> sorry. Now, uh, in your coaching, Steve, is it what would be the key physiological thing that you would be training an athlete on? Like what? What do you find is most important for triathlon? Um, I, I think that very much depends on on the athlete. And mm-hmm. uh, so with, I, I've always can say about, her, and I'll, I'll maybe talk about her going into the Sydney Games. But when um, I first met Sean on a women's training weekend, and um, her name then was Sean Pilling, and Sarah Springman said to me, Steve, you want to have a look at this Sean? You know, she's a really, really good runner. And I went, oh, okay. So the first session I was taking was a swim session. And I'm looking at Sean in the pool. And I'm going, no, Sarah, you got it wrong. This girl's a swimmer. So she came to me um, with a great running pedigree. She had a scholarship to Florida State University and a full, full run scholarship. Mm-hmm. But it also swam at junior international level. So what, what I'm looking at with her is um, how do we really improve on the bike? Is that um, how do we adapt from being a track runner to being a 10k runner and, and that's that's always doable and what do we need to make that 30 40 second difference on the 1500 meter swim so you, you've got to look at what people have and you've got to look at where they where they came from what's what sort of background mm-hmm. um, and I think probably over the last maybe 15 years, we've got athletes now, we've been triathletes forever. Certainly, you know, 35, God, nearly 40 years ago when I started racing triathlon, everybody came from a sport. You know, you're mm-hmm. a swimmer and mm-hmm. you learn the other stuff. Or you're a cyclist and you learn the other stuff. Or maybe you'd come from two, which gave you a little bit of an advantage, but then maybe the third one was that much weaker. So I, I think with the physiological stuff, yeah, we, we know, you know, you've got, to, you've got to get the endurance base and then you work on that. Um, but it, it's very much looking at the individual. You know, you, you can set, this is your base program, bang. Um, if you're training maybe nine times as a week as a sort of dedicated age grouper, and you could be doing three swim sessions, three run sessions, three bike sessions. And I think that's realistic for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. But if you're an international swimmer and you can't run without falling over, maybe we'll do an extra run session and, and back off one of the swimmings, you know? Mm-hmm. It's, it's that whole juggling bit, isn't it? Triathletes are great jugglers. You know, you, you've got the three balls, you've got to keep them all going in the air at the, at the same time. Yeah. yeah. Does that make sense in it? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's good. And, and how would that differ from more elite? and professional athletes because i think a lot of age group athletes see on instagram or videos on youtube of the professional athletes and what they do and they try and replicate it but they don't understand that the professionals and elites are recovering they're sleeping during the day their their whole life is dedicated to training and recovering so how can an age group athlete or how does an age group athlete training differ from a professional when you get a professional athlete and, and the magazines will do an interview and then in the magazine on the right hand side normally at the top corner and it's got typical week of training for Jan Frodeno, Alistair Brownlee, Daniela Reeve and you're looking at that and you're going no that, that's just crazy that's absolutely crazy I think there are a couple of things here I think number one whatever standard athlete you are you tend to put in your very best of what you might have done in each, I'm not frozen, on each individual thing. So, so that typical week will become the best ever cycling, the best ever running, the best ever swimming week that you've ever done. Yeah. You know, and an age group, you've got to say, this does is not thing. And the other thing, Emmett, you're quite rightly, you know, a professional athlete doesn't have a day off because when they're not training, they're resting. Mm-hmm. You know, they're resting every single afternoon. They're going to bed for an hour or a couple of hours. It's their job. It's their life. It's their income. Age groupers, we, we're all getting out there and, you know, you've got to juggle again. So you're doing the, the early morning swim session from 6 to 
Then you go into work. You maybe get out for a run in the centre of the city of London for 30, 40 minutes at lunchtime. And then you come back absolutely shattered and you, you want to go out for a bike ride or you're getting on the turbo. Mm-hmm. Um, well, pro goes, well, no, I'm, you know, I'm staying in bed till eight o'clock this morning because I need my rest. And, you know, that that's the difference. So there is that, you know, let, let's be realistic about all this stuff. Um, aim high, but, you, 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 you know, if you aim too high, you're setting yourself up for failure. Yeah. And, and I think that's a mistake that some athletes can make. And then you get that total disillusionment and you, you don't want to go out to play anymore. It's just become, I, I really don't enjoy this. Mm-hmm. I think you have to, as an age group athlete in particular, you have to just know your level. And as you say, you want to aim high and have goals, but you need to know your level and what you can manage consistently week in, week out over months and years rather than do to go beyond what you can handle mentally and f- physically and and family life and work life for two or three weeks and then do yeah. nothing for well, months. So. The, whole, um, the whole of society has changed over the last 30, 40 years because... You know, if you, if you if you go back, well, even in my memory, rugby players, like rugby union players getting paid, oh, my God, hey, you can't do that. You know, it was rugby union, rugby league. Cricket players, no, you don't get money. Tennis players, you've got to be an amateur. Mm-hmm. And triathletes, you know, now it is a profession, professional sport. It's there. It, it is a, it's a proper job. You're very, very well rewarded at the very top level. Mm-hmm. If money drops off very quickly, it really does. Yeah. Um, but the, the, you know, the chances of not making it are absolutely huge. And I think the, the there's a lot of the age group age groupers have it better. You know, we we have um, so okay, an age grouper. You've got you've got the sport, your hobby, triathlon. Mm-hmm. Um, you've got family. You've got your friends. You've got your job. So there's pretty much that that's what you go around on. You know, it's great. Oh, I really love my job. Uh, my, my wife loves me. I've got some good friends. And triathlon's lovely. Okay? If you're a pro triathlete, your friends are the guys you're working with in triathlon. Um, your job is your hobby, relying mm-hmm. on your money. You know, and, and if one thing goes wrong as a pro, you can lose pretty much everything. Mm-hmm. You know, as, as a pro triathlete, you get injured. Okay, you lose your job, you lose your hobby, you lose your money, and to a large extent, you're not going to be seeing your friends because they're the guys that you're traveling the circuit with. Mm-hmm. So the downsides can be huge. So you know that element of reality is very, very important. And when when young athletes quite rightly would say, "I want to be a pro. I want to be world champion. I want to do this." That's when sometimes you, you, you mustn't say, oh, no, don't be crazy. But I think you have to say, OK, let's look an up and let's look down on this, you know. Um, and sometimes you have to say, and I, I'm not, I don't think I'm strong enough to say it in a lot of ways, but some, some coaches will say, look, it ain't going to happen. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you will be a great age grouper, but you ain't going to make it as a pro. So, so don't do it because you're setting yourself up for failure. Yeah, that sounds really down, but I think it's honest. Yeah, I think I heard um, Gavin Noble, who's a former oh, Irish guy. Olympian, and um, he runs a coaching business, Hop Hop, now in in Ireland. And I don't think it was com- what he when I heard him say this. I don't think it was coming from what you were saying there. He's not he, he's not discouraging any of that as athletes, but I heard him say that any of us like mid 20s or early 20s athletes he like encourages them to be either in school full-time education or university or have a job or have a degree behind them that they can go back to before fully pursuing it which i find interesting and is obviously sensible but then you have the other end of these young athletes like the norwegians gustav feeden blumfeldt alex ye that are coming through and well, I'm not sure about someone, but like a lot of them are doing it just all in in triathlon, which is interesting too. And obviously, the one, the names we've mentioned there, it's paid off for them. But um, it's just the one extreme to the other. That, what's your thoughts on that? 
Well, I think you've got guys like Alex who is doing his degree as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, obviously, now with with the situation with professional sport, um, the you know the various universities, whether it's Loughborough, Leeds, Bath, wherever, you know, they can offer the scholarships there. But mm-hmm. there there is a, a moral need to offer a good education as well. Mm-hmm. And I, I I did an interview with with Alex with the with the London region a few years ago before he was going off to university uh, and at that time he was very much oh no I'm, I'm doing this because you know I've got to get an education yeah um and Alistair you know um sports science I mean Alistair actually was it Oxford or Cambridge I think it was Oxford and he only mm-hmm. did a term there because yeah. that didn't deal with what he wanted yeah but he's a very very special talent you know, you, you don't go to three games, two Olympic golds on, on the back of nothing. So there was obviously there, but it, it worked for him to stay in Leeds and do his degree there and be able to stay at home, coach, train with his brother, train with the group there. Yeah. Uh, and I think, you know, one of the things that Alistair and Johnny did was being in Leeds, they attracted a lot of top triathletes there. Not not just the Brits, but from literally all over the world. Mm-hmm. So once once you get that sort of philosophy of success and a, and a good group around you, that's going to lead to more and more. And I think when you when you see some of the um, the top coaches now, and it's very much a professional squad, yeah, and you know, attract the guys who want to be good. One one of the things that I, I did learn as coaching was with with my groups right the way through if somebody wanted somebody new wanted to come in and join the group it would be very much saying to the group oh look i've had a so and so jimmy smith said he'd like to come and join in and train with us what do you reckon now if there was a silence i was pretty sure that jimmy smith might not be an asset to the group you know because that that's how you build on it yeah and um, we we call it the uh, the energy sappers you know somebody comes into the group and the water is too cold or they get their lay or why are we swimming this way around the lane or i i don't feel great today coach you know so you've only got to have one person in a group like that who can really bring it down mm-hmm. you know really bring it down so you, you've got to look at the group dynamics. I think that's really, really important. And with um, sometimes working with with international, with either national teams or international groups, you're looking at the various dynamics that are happening there. Um, very often behind the scenes, but sometimes right on top of the scene as well. You know, and if you've got a, a, a multinational group, you, you can see sometimes. Okay, we're going for a we're going for a two hour ride. And we're going to be doing this. And about half an hour in, somebody will just start just knocking up the speed just that little bit, just that little bit. And whether that's to assert their authority or just to say, I'm a, I'm a bit better than you. You know, it's, it's, it's very, you know, the group dynamics are, are absolutely huge. And I, and I do see that even on, um, I say the training camp, I only, I do a couple of training camps a year now, uh, one in Bermuda and one in Italy. The, the Bermuda camp is really quite young kids, so great. But you've still got to look at the dynamics of maybe who's not friends with who at school mm-hmm. and looking at how you split them around. Italy is very much a, a grown-up group, and it is a very, very adult grown-up group. Average age two years ago was over 50, which is fine. But there are group dynamics that work there. Mm-hmm. you know. And it, it's, uh, I think coaching is very much managing those dynamics as well. And uh, I think over... Over the 30 plus years I've been doing doing training camps, we, we, we've had on, only maybe two athletes who haven't been invited back. And that, that's not athletes who not wanted to come back themselves, but athletes where we've just felt that really didn't work. Mm-hmm. That really didn't work. Um, and it, it's, um, I don't know if it's a skill or not, but, it, but it's something you, you have to handle very, very carefully. Yeah, very careful. As a coach. And I'm, I'm sure with, you know, if you look at all the all the national teams going to world championships and Olympic games, where there's there's great selection issues on. I mean, even at the moment with the um, with the British men at the moment, we've got 
two slots for Tokyo. One mm-hmm. has gone already to Johnny Brownlee. Mm-hmm. So you've got Alistair Brownlee, Alex, a couple of others there. So yeah. I'm not dealing with anything like that at the moment. But you can imagine going out to the races, being the coach or the team manager, that, that that's how you've got to deal with. And if you look back, maybe look at the, oh, wow, look at the Aussie girls going into the 2000 games. I mean, top five in the world, and they can only take three. Mm-hmm. <sighs> And you, you get a little bit of the politics and oh, all that sort of thing coming into it. So, yeah. yeah, it becomes very complicated. And, you know, the politics in sport can sometimes not be very nice at all. Yeah, yeah. And then, Steve, you, <laughs> you also do a lot of commentary for the, the iconic voice of yours in the BBC <laughs> and the triathlon, this woman. With an iconic voice. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put that in the title. Iconic voice, Steve <laughs> True. Um, but tell us a bit about that. And is that something you, you enjoy doing and continuing to be around the races? And yeah. Yeah, I, I Emmett, I get the biggest buzz from that. I absolutely love it. You, you know, you you you're trying to create a rapport with the with the audience, with with the listeners, whatever. Um, and equally, you want to try and establish a good relationship with the athletes. Mm-hmm. And, I, you know, from the athlete's point of view, you, you've got to give them credit for what they've done. You, you, can't, you can't put people down. Um, and and if, you, if you're talking generally, if you're commentating generally, um, I think it's important to not, not just to say what you can see, because everyone can see that. You know, if you're mm-hmm. watching a TV screen, Everyone can see that Alistair Brownlee is leaving. But what you might be doing is may- maybe some of the thinking that's going on in the background or, you know, what, what, why, how he's thinking about that. Um, well, one of the things that sort of instantly came to mind was, was doing a, a World Cup race and Laura Rebag before she married Greg. And I'm, I was thinking, hey, what, what are you doing, Laura? You're not working on the bike. And all of a sudden it was ding. She's sitting on the back before you know, legal drafting would be came in and she was, mm-hmm. I've got this, I've got this sorted. You know, I think what well, absolutely brilliant there. You've got two American girls in front of her, Laura sitting there, gets out on the run. Thank you very much. Bang, off we go. So so it, it's having having raced never to that level, but having raced, you you try to read a little bit of racing. Mm-hmm. Um and you you wanna you want to inform the people who are there listening. Uh, you want to make it entertaining as well, and, and if you can establish that, that's lovely. And I still, I've, I've missed commentating the last two years. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, I've got a, I've got a commentary of the Castle Triathlon Series in the first week in July, and I cannot wait for it. Windsor has sadly been cancelled because of the COVID and the restrictions there. Um, I'm not doing BBC anymore, mm-hmm. um, which I do miss greatly. But it, it's going to happen. You can't look back and go, "That's not fair." Things change, yeah. yeah. You know, things change, and that's quite right. Yeah. But and... so I love. You know, I think again, I was maybe I was very lucky, sort of coming in at the right time. Uh, again, probably a little bit of teaching background where you fairly comfortable with, with being with a group and just speaking. God, that mm. sounds so flash. I'm really sorry, City of Derry. I apologise for being flash. Oh. <laughs> I love working with Peter Jack. Peter Jack, superstar. Lovely man. And um, w- will you be in commentating in the Olympics this year? Or do you know yet? No. No, no. no they, won't, they won't be going to say, okay. Um, I would very much think it's uh, for BBC, I think it will be um, Annie Emerson and Matt Chilton. Uh, okay. I can't see anybody else. Um, they've used Vicky, but of course Vicky is racing. Um, yeah, I, it, it's it's going to be it's going to be those. Yeah. Two, I'm sure it is. It's, it's quite and good they, when they uh, when they bring someone in an athlete. I think Lucy Hall done a bit and Vicky Holland done a bit. It's quite good, I think, when you get that athlete on the commentary as yeah. well and getting that extra insight of like they yeah. race the the same people. So she's she's raced at that level and she, and she can read a, a race brilliantly. Um, mm-hmm. I've loved working with. Um, uh, John Levson over the years on, on live commentary and Annie, we've had a 
a few opportunities where the three of us work together uh, mm -hmm. and it just becomes a party, you know, you, because you, you, you can't have an ego if you mm -hmm. commentate it and you, you've got to be able to throw. So you can't say, I'll bring him in. I'll, I'll take him over the line. You know, that it doesn't matter. It's who's going to be best for bringing a female athlete over the line. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter if it's a male commentator or a female commentator, but who's, Excuse me. Who's going to read that particular thing best? Who who's going to be most knowledgeable on on the bike section? Yeah. Who's going to be most knowledgeable on on the swimming and how it's developing? Mm -hmm. So so working with uh, John Levison and Annie Emerson for oh, a whole bunch of years, um, it's great. And and you can say, look, what, what I'd like to do, I've maybe heard something from training camp, or John, you got any info on what's happening on the last about bike testing? So you, you, you've got to work to each other's strengths. Yeah. And, and I say again, you know, you, you can't have an ego to say, you know, this is my race. Listen to me, everybody. It's Steve True telling you all about triathlon. That's mm -hmm. rubbish. Yeah. You know, you've got to inform and you've got to entertain. And, and hopefully you've got to make a, a few laughs as well. Yeah, yeah. Steve, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. It's been great to get in the chat. I've got a few yeah. quick fire questions, if you don't mind. Sure. Just a few, a few quick, quick questions. So, favorite training session as an athlete or as a coach to give out? Well, across any sport, which was your favorite session to do your or coach? <laughs> okay, favorite swim session. Um, we are going to do a 20 minute swim. No, we're going to do a 16 minute swim. And you've got to do as many hundreds as you can with a 15 second recovery. Bang. I like then that. 12 minutes, two minute recovery, 12 minute swim. We are going to do as many 75 meter repetitions as you can with a 10 second recovery. Two minute recovery after that. We are going to do an eight minute swim. You see where we're going on this. Um, we're going to do eight minute swim with as many 50s as you can with a five second recovery. So what we're looking to do is to hopefully get the same amount of 75s and 50s as we did the 100 coming down. Mm -hmm. And then all the athletes are thinking, OK, we've got a two minute recovery. I know what he's going to do. We're going to do a four minute swim with as many 25 seconds as we can and 25 meters with whatever. And you go, no, actually, we're doing a straight four minute swim. Go for it. That's that's nice. I really like that one. Um, I like that. The, I think I'll give that a go. I'll give it a go next week. Get over on it. it. It's a nice, It goes very very quickly. Um, what else do I do? Oh, favorite run session. Uh, I've got got a few of those. Uh, nice easy one. Reducing recovery two hundred meters. So we're going to do a, a two hundred meter run. Um, we can work out the time you're aiming for by your best 800 or 1500. We're going to have 90 seconds recovery jog. We're going to do another 200 meter run, 75 seconds recovery. See where we're going? Mm -hmm. 200 meter run, 60 seconds recovery, down to 45, 30, 15, and we're in again. And the idea is you just got to keep hitting the same time. Now, that to me is a great, great session for dealing with pain mm -hmm. um, and we go through maybe we'll go through and do actually 19 repetitions so we go through sort of each series 90 75 down three times through mm -hmm. with the m so so that's a nice one it's again it's a relatively short session um and that there's another one all based on 10k pace which i use with a, a, a lot of the athletes uh, and it's um it's running a a 400 meters at 10k pace, 300 meters at 5k pace, 200 meters at 800, 1500 meter pace, 100 meters almost flat out, reducing recovery right the way through, and then we go again and we go again. And I, I pinched that, I pinched that session from a an East German website, and then I found out however many athletes had been using that, like runners. Um, I know, I know Paula was using that when she was running 10,000 metres and of, obviously the marathon. Mm -hmm. You know, just, just you've you got to put yourself under pressure. Yeah. You've got to put yourself under pressure. Um, but then 
you know, the upside of that is once it's done, everyone comes out and think, oh, that was great. That was great. I really hurt. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Good there stuff. You go. Good sessions. A few to try for everyone listening and myself. I'll let you know exactly. how I get on. Um, favorite training destination? Oh, wow. We have this training camp in Italy, Cesenatico. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll do an advert. Hotel Beausoleil, uh, the guy who owns a hotel, Dante Del Vecchio, ex pro bikey. He's got a six lane, 25 meter pool right by the hotel. We are next to the woods where you can do repetitions on just on paths and a good, or oh, must be at least 10 yards, get onto the beach for open water swimming. And then you get on the bike, you've got a 10, 15 meter flat, and you're in the mountains. Fabulous, fabulous destination. Perfect. Stellenbosch, South Africa, wonderful. Really, really wonderful. And I suppose back in the day, Stoke Mandeville for the old, the, like some of the, um, the group sessions, the British sessions, use that with my own squad. If, if you've got the facilities there, got a swimming pool and a track, Run, uh, cycling, yeah, nice to be on nice outside roads. We can do a lot of quality work on the turbos. But if you uh, if you want to come abroad to a training camp, everybody, Steve True's camp in Italy, that's Chesanatico. My email address is <laughs> perfect. <laughs> I'll sign up. Um, in your opinion, who is the best ever male? triathlete and best ever female triathlete ever oh my god you have to pick one of each just oh i i am not opting out honestly but it's i i don't know how you do that there's mm. so many different just you know you you look at iron man with um chrissy wellington paula oh daniela now dave scott mark allen Fredino, mm-hmm. you know, Fredino, Olympic champion and Ironman champion, however many times. Uh, guys like Greg Welch, world champion, Ironman champion, Karen Smyers. It, 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 the guys who can carry it on and over. You know, we, we see what Alistair does at Ironman as he keeps going through. That, that almost seems progression with so many people, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. You know, we, it's like a Olympic distance. Um, Flora Duffy in Bermuda, you know, what, what she's achieved uh, and still going so, so strong. Yeah. Uh, and what she's learned, how she's learned to run. My goodness me, over the years, fabulous. Oh, I on, Honestly, I'm not opting out. I really, yeah. I, I, I couldn't put that's, that's yeah, okay. probably, be, probably be a contract out on me anyway if I did that. <laughs> um, right, this one. You, you don't you, you can't opt out of this one again male and female who have you who's your pick for olympic champion this year on the male and female side oh. wow christian blumenfeld good pick that's a real just seeing as what he's done this year after the yeah. layoff with the world's yeah. crikey Okay, here we go. One of the British girls. Yeah, Can't say who. Yeah. I wouldn't be allowed to go to a race ever. Be interesting to see what happens at Leeds this weekend coming. Mm-hmm. No, well, Very yeah. I think um, Georgia Taylor Brown could be. Could be. She's awesome. Could be there. So there bite. Jessica and Georgia are just they're just awesome. Yeah. See what with the selection race where they got DQ'd for going over hand in hand. And then Vicky getting a bronze last time out and with the experience of London acting pretty much as a an assist athlete. Yeah. Yeah. Um yeah, they've got a strong, a strong lineup. Excuse me? They have a strong lineup, the British girls. They have a good chance between the really good. And you know that that's you know, the guys who are not there, Jody Stimson, uh, Helen Jenkins, yeah, there's loads is coming through. Mm-hmm. You, you create that, you almost create the, the lineage, don't you? It, it's like um, Co, Ovet, Cram, 
back back running in the 70s you know you get the guys and then you get Peter Elliott coming through Steve Crabb going through Tom McKean it just continues uh, Jamaican sprinters American sprinters male and female you know they've they've created that thing mm-hmm. and, it, and it's very easy to say oh maybe there's natural physical advantages but you look at the physical makeup of all those athletes and you look how countries will change so I, there, there, there's a huge social thing going through on that and I think that's maybe what the British girls have at the moment and I think they've the, the Aussie girls certainly had it the American yeah. girls certainly had it. but the nations change and, and with the Brits when you, we, you had Alistair and Johnny obviously um, the New Zealanders with, with Hamish and, and Brad it's yeah mm-hmm. hands up can't choose Okay, and final question, Steve. If you had one, what, what's your best piece of advice you would have for a young athlete that is hope, hoping to be a professional and compete at elite level? Three parts, okay? Part number one, decide exactly what you want, exactly. So you can't say, I want to be good. You've got to say, I want to win the Irish Junior National Championships next year. Mm-hmm. Then you've got to be even more exact, and you've got to say, to do that, I need a swim time of 20.30, I need a bike time of 58.50, and I need a run time of 33.10. And then the third thing you've got to say, and what do I have to give up to do that? So that's maybe not having six bottles of wine every night, just having what, you know what I mean? Watching, watching, live like an athlete. Yeah. Um, watch what you eat, watch what you drink, watch how much you sleep, watch how you recover. You know, it's that whole thing. If, if you, if you want to be that good, you've, you've got to lay it out for yourself because you can always go back there. How mm-hmm. good do I want to be? Okay. What do I need to do that? These are the times. How do I progress that in the training? You know, and one of the things with Sean going to the Olympics, we needed to get 40 seconds off of a 1500 meter time swimming. And you say, well, that's crazy. You can't do that. Well, actually, it's a couple of seconds off each hundred. Mm-hmm. Oh, right. Okay. How many training sessions do we have between now and the Olympics? Well, we've got 150 sessions. So can we drop two seconds? in 150 seconds, ding, you know, just breaking everything down, breaking it down, making it manageable. Sounds good. Great advice. Steve, thanks a million for coming on. It's been a great chat. So much information, so much coaching tips, so much knowledge and about a crack as well. So thanks for your time. Thank you. So show's over, everybody. Thanks so much for listening. Hope you enjoyed that episode with Steve. I want to thank Steve for coming on and giving us his time. It was a great episode with some great coaching tips, some great advice, and there's a lot of value in there and a good bit of crack as well. So hope you enjoyed it. And if you did enjoy it, please share it on to anyone that might be interested. Um, leave a review. Let us know what you think. Just give me a message and let, let me know what you think of the show. It's appreciated, anyone who listens, and we continue to get some great guests on here, and we'll continue to do so as well. So thanks for listening. Thanks for the support. Really appreciate it. Cheers. Bye.